So this is a picture of my little boy. I love this collage. It has some of my, my favorite pictures, Alex in the band, his smile, his dimples. Alex was only 14 years old when he was murdered in the Parkland school shooting in his English class. Alex was a member of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Eagle Regiment Marching Band. Alex was a great basketball player as well, won multiple championships. He always wanted to play defense. I wanted him to play offense. He ended up playing more defense, but he always got picked high in the draft. And when I sent Alex to school, I thought he would come home to me like he always has. Unfortunately, a, a mass murderer with an AR-15 and a rifle bag shot into Alex's classroom, murdered three kids in just Alex's classroom, and then went classroom to classroom in just three minutes and 51 seconds, murdering 17 and injuring another 17. Here's a video of Alex. He did so much practicing at the, for the band during the summer, in the hot Florida summer. Uh, this is him playing one of his, his favorite uh, theme songs. You'll probably recognize it. Alex would, would love the new Game of Thrones series, and, and we miss him every day. After the shooting, nothing else seemed to matter in my life, and so I put all that behind me. And so uh, after the shooting, in a lot of these states, the governor forms a commission to investigate the tragedy. That's what we did in Florida. Former governor of Florida, Rick Scott, now senator, formed the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Commission. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I wanted to be on that commission. I wanted to find out what happened to Alex, and I wanted to hold those individuals accountable. I developed the, uh, this idea to create this federal school safety clearinghouse, and I'm going to talk about that. That's schoolsafety.gov. That has been one of, one of the biggest accomplishments post-Parkland at the federal level. I also founded a charity, My Wife and I Save Schools for Alex, and we're doing a lot of great things uh, around data and school safety incident reporting, and I want to talk to you about that, get your opinion on that. Uh, I've also made over two dozen trips to Washington, D.C. the last four years, met with presidents, vice presidents, hundreds of members of Congress. I work with the National Sheriff's Association. I'm on their school safety and security committee. I'm also part of IACP's uh, Mass Violence Advisory Initiative, which is a peer-to-peer -peer response group uh, to respond to the next tragedy. So we're the first, this is the first time the federal government or any, any entity uh, has set up an, an, an organization where we surge into the next community that suffers from a mass casualty event. And so we bring subject matter expertise uh, unlike any other from, from SMEs that have lived this and, and gone through a tragedy in, in their community and, and we're here to help. I also work with the FBI, I present to FBI BAU and also the Secret Service. Now at 11, making our schools safer. President Trump talking safety with Parkland parents as we prepare to mark two years since the tragedy that's already changed so much. New laws, new security systems, and tonight, new best practices for the nation. Well, today, several parents whose children died two years ago met with the president as his initiative was launched. CBS 4's Kerry Codd is live in Fort Lauderdale to give us some details on it. Kerry? Elliot Rudabay, I remember about a year ago, I talked with Max Schachter, whose son Alex was murdered at Stoneman Douglas. Max was working tirelessly to create a federal database, federal clearinghouse of best practice information on school safety, school security, and today Max's goal became a reality. And for the last two years, I've been working on having something good come from this horrible tragedy, and today we have it. 
That's Max Schachter, father of Parkland victim Alex Schachter. Max posted a video on Twitter Monday after the Trump administration created schoolsafety.gov, a website that Schachter championed to house information on what schools can do to best protect students and staff. And schools can actually go online and fill out a questionnaire and get a detailed plan on what they've done so far and where their gaps are. Schachter's mission grew out of the Parkland shooting. He says the measures are low cost but will have high impact, like creating threat assessment teams, creating apps like Fortify FL where people can report suspicious activity at schools, and having active shooter drills like this one in Miami in 2018 that CBS 4 News reported on. We wanted to make these foundational elements uh, you know, applicable to all schools. Monday, the focus shifted to school safety and the efforts of Max Schachter and the Stand with Parkland organization. I know that Alex is, is looking down uh, from, from heaven, and um, I know that he's happy uh, with all the good work that, that not only myself, but all of the, the victims' families from this horrible tragedy are working towards. So I traveled the country after the shooting. My anger fueled my drive for change and to make sure that this never happened again. And as I, as I engaged with school districts all over the country, what I found was that many used to ask me, Max, where are these best practices? You know, where, where are these standards? What should we do first? What should we do second? And so that's where this idea to come up with this federal school safety clearinghouse came from. And President Trump agreed with my idea, and he, uh, he put it in DHS. So it's the new federal school safety clearinghouse called schoolsafety.gov. If you interact with schools, I highly recommend you, you recommend your districts, your uh, school administrators to search out schoolsafety.gov. It's, uh, it's a one-stop shop for all school safety best practices, resources, and dollars. So President, uh, so this is just one of, the, one of the interactions, one of the meetings I had with the former president, Vice President Pence, and, um, and then I was just at the White House just several months ago because President Biden just included my bill, the Luke and Alex School Safety Act, which basically codifies, makes permanent schoolsafety.gov into law. Uh, I had a nice conversation with the Vice President and um, also spent some time with the President. And so what he did was uh, now all of these dollars, these hundreds of millions of dollars that this new uh, bipartisan Safer Communities Act, all that money for school safety is going to be, is going to funnel through schoolsafety.gov. So not only can you find best practices and resources, you can also, it's a place they have a grant finder tool. So they've got billions of dollars on schoolsafety.gov. It's really a model for what the federal government can, can build if they work together. It's, um, they signed an MOU, so it's not just DHS. It's, it's DOJ, it's, it's Department of Education, it's HHS, all working together as a whole of government approach. And I'm really happy with the results. This is uh, the White House. And so here's the Bipartisan Safer Community Act. It's really tiny up here, but you'll see down at the bottom, it talks about schoolsafety.gov. One-stop shop, access to federal school safety resources programs, actionable recommendations to support school efforts. Okay, you can find information on bullying, cybersecurity, targeted violence, mental health, everything you need to make your school safer. Transition a little bit, I want to talk about the commission. The MSD commission, I wanted to be on it, and that's been uh, where a lot of my work in Florida has stemmed from. And I'm going to talk about the Parkland school shooting. It's one of my missions. I want everybody to know what happened in Parkland so we can do everything we can to make sure this never happens again. But the Parkland Shooting Commission that I'm on, uh, we were really the investigative body for the Parkland tragedy. We investigated all the interactions between the Parkland murderer and the school board, the murder and law enforcement. We investigated all the failed law enforcement response. And then our job was to come up with recommendations to make schools safer, which has resulted in multiple pieces of school safety legislation, which has been signed into law by Governor DeSantis. And we have not taken our foot off of the gas. We just met last month, and we are forming three subcommittees. So we're doing a lot even further, and it's four and a half years post-Parkland. So 
Uh, the difference in Florida versus other states is in Florida, we prioritize safety and security like no other. Um, we've got the great Donna Michaelis here. She's going to talk later. So Virginia's doing some amazing things. Uh, but Florida really understands. We had a lot of state legislators that came down to Parkland. They walked through that building and those images on their brain, they'll never forget. And that really set the stage for, for all the school safety legislation. All the, the legislators in Texas should do that as well. So in Parkland, there's a lot of complacency. It, would, it won't happen here. And as I travel the country, that's what I see. A lot of complacency. They don't think it's going to happen here. I guarantee they didn't think it was going to happen in Uvalde. The principal was disengaged and uninvolved in the threat assessment process. When we interviewed him and we asked him how many threats were to your school, he said, I don't really know. That's not my area. He didn't know how many threats were to shoot up the school. He had no idea. He was disengaged and uninvolved in the process. Let's talk about the murderer. So his birth mother worked on the streets. She was a prostitute. Uh, she became pregnant, gave him up for adoption. He was adopted by a loving family. He lived in an affluent Parkland house, 4,500 square foot, had everything that a child would ever want. Started exhibiting violent behavior at age three years old. His father died when he was five. His mother died in 2017. He had accumulated over 70 disciplinary incidents. He had an IEP that created a bubble around him. He became so violent during school that they required an escort when he went to the bathroom, when he went to lunch or switched classes. He later transferred to a, uh, a school for uh, behaviorally challenged children with special needs. He was eventually expelled from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. But there were a lot of silos. So in school, a lot of violence, a lot of disruptive behavior. Out of school, law enforcement was at his house over 40 times. Law enforcement didn't know what was going on in school. School didn't know what was happening outside of school. He was obsessed with guns and death, never arrested. And then when he turned 18, his mother bought him a gun. His mother was afraid of him. He had knocked her teeth out. And he was 19 at the time. Common misconception amongst school officials and law enforcement is we expelled the kid. We suspended him. We Baker acted him. We arrested him. We're good. You're not good. This individual came back to school and murdered my son and 16 others a year later. We're going to talk about threat assessments and threat management later. But he shot 34 people, killing 17 in under four minutes. He was suicidal. He was homicidal. He killed and mutilated animals. He had all the red flags of a future uh, school mass murderer. And we're going to show, I'm going to show you those red flags right now. There are at least 30 different people had knowledge uh, of troubling behavior. Some said some things, some did not. There were six different instances of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas staff being notified. 19 times a knife, a book. A firearm was seen in his possession online. Let's talk about some tips that came in. In February, so this is, this is, this is Valentine's Day 2018 is when the shooting happened. In February of 2016, a Broward Sheriff's Office deputy received a, um, received a report of an unnamed, from an unnamed neighbor who said the murderer was posting photos of himself with guns on Instagram and saying that he planned to shoot up his high school. In September of that same year, the SRO at Douglas reported to the sheriff's office that he ingested gasoline in an effort to commit suicide and was cutting. It was also reported that he stated he wanted to buy a gun and that he had possessed hate-related symbols. In January of the next year, he reported, uh, was reported for an assault and referred for a threat assessment that was completely botched. We'll talk about that. And then in September of 2017, a Mississippi bails bondsman named Ben Knight received a comment on his YouTube channel from the murderer. I'm going to show you all those comments. 
In the post, Cruz said that he was going to be a professional school shooter. He immediately reported the information to the FBI. The next day, two agents interviewed him. They closed the case in October of that year. Here's, another, here's, one, here's that tip from the Broward Sheriff's Office. So Deputy Trias, a 19-year veteran, received a uh, written reprimand after, after the shooting over a 911 call in November of 2017 from a woman concerned that the murderer had multiple guns, threatened to kill himself, and could wind up a school shooter. He denied getting specific Instagram addresses and told investigators he didn't have an Instagram account and is not really familiar with social media. So this has identified a huge gap in law enforcement. A, we really have to do a better job in, in raising their level of expertise to analyze threats emanating from social media. He said he could have done more. This is the post that the murderer posted on Ben Knight's YouTube channel that, that elicited his call to the FBI. He did the right thing. He saw something and he said something. And so the shooting, again, Valentine's Day 2018, this is January 5th, the caller told the FBI that she was even more concerned about his propensity for violence because he had been acquiring guns, rifles since his mother's death. Before his mother died, he had pulled a rifle on his mother. Then after her death, he took money out of her account and bought all these rifles and ammunition that he posted pictures of them online. He explained that his Instagram account contained photos of animals that he had mutilated and killed. She told the FBI. The caller gave the FBI specific details about his Instagram account, spelling them out letter by letter, the handles that he used on Instagram. So here are the lessons learned. So the Bureau did not forward this information to the local Miami field office so they could uh, have additional steps. The Bureau did not pass along this information to local law enforcement in Parkland, and they did not notify uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Now, thank God, in, in light of what happened, the FBI has completely transformed. This was the former PAL line, and uh, we just had a presentation. Now they have fixed a lot of this, and um, that's where we have NTOC from. So the FBI has done a good job fixing all of the failures from Parkland. So this is a letter, another, another uh, gap, another uh, not connecting dots. This is a letter that just came out, so we're going through the Parkland trial right now. The murderer for three and a half years pleaded not guilty, and um, he saw the writing on the wall. He changed his plea to guilty. So now we're in the penalty phase. We're going through it right now. As I'm driving here, I live in South Florida. I'm listening to the trial um, as I'm driving up, and so we're in the penalty phase right now. And this, this was just released in, in the trial, that this is a letter from his, his, his special education school uh, where he got much more specialized attention from Cross Creek, currently attends Cross Creek, a separate Broward County public school. And this is a letter from the psychologist and psychiatrist from that school to his current, Brett Nagin, to his current psychiatrist. Now it says, at the, the school is telling the psychiatrist, hey, I want you to, this is a heads up, I want you to know what's happening in school in case you don't know. At home, he continues to be aggressive and destructive with minimal provocation. For instance, he destroyed a television after losing a video game. He has a hatchet, the mother can't find it. He destroyed a poultry, uh, a, upholstery and furniture, carving holes. Per recent information shared in school, he dreams of killing others and is covered in blood. In, in testimony this last week, the psychiatrist said he never got the letter. So I wanna shift a little, a, a, a little bit to, to looking at, at the murderer's Insta, uh, internet searches. When I saw this, I couldn't believe it. So let's look at this. This is from his Google account. 
okay, July 7th of 2017. He searched for AR-15 magazines, searched for movie theater massacre, searched for gun case. He got out of an Uber with a gun case, with his AR-15 and a rifle bag. So back in 2017, he's searching for a gun case, searched Virginia Tech massacre. So now we're July 15th of 2017. He searched for McDonald's mass shooting. This is, this is uh, another, this is YouTube search. He searched for pumped up kicks, Columbine High School. Search for how to become evil in society. He searched for pumped up kicks again. Search for park shooting. Search for Charlottesville shooting. Search for how to shoot at 500 yards. Search for Polytech Massacre. Search for wanting to kill people. Search for school massacre kids with guns. Search for Columbine Massacre. Search for massacre in a hotel. Search for Polytech Massacre full movie. Search for gun that was used in the Las Vegas Massacre. Search for 100 round drum AR-15. Search for AR-15 shooting. Polytech massacre, school shooting. Search for top 10 murders caught on camera. Top 10 murders caught on tape. Search for shooting at girls. Search for Stoneman Douglas. Search for Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Now this is November of 2017. This happened Valentine's 2018. Search for I want to kill people. Search for massacre, search for massacre killing. Search for school shooting books. School shooter test, how to become a school shooter. Search for Aurora shooting victims, Aurora massacre. Virginia Tech mass or a documentary. Search for being shot with an AR-15. Search for shooting people, search for killing people. Search for why I want to kill woman. Search for best places for a massacre. Search for Smith and Wesson. Search for massacre. Over and over. This last, this last post, search for school shooting. This is 2018. This happened Valentine's Day 2018. February 2018, search for Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. February 2018, search for Marjorie Stoneman Douglas hours. And less than two weeks later. He's searching for the map. He's searching for a soft guitar case. That's what he used in the Uber. Let's look at his YouTube comments, his public YouTube comments. When I turn 21, I'm going to kill people. In 2020, you will hear me on the news doing this. On the night of my massacre, you are not forgotten, Elliot. May you rip. It makes me happy to see people die. Unbelievable posts, all public online. I already see my future, nothing but loneliness. I wish to keep something in the history books like Eric and Dylan. I'm going to kill people, 2020. I'd rather kill people. Just on and on. It's all there, public. I just hate people in general. I'm a mass murderer with interesting thoughts of death and destruction. I want to kill people. I hate people. January 2018. This is some, this is some reports from the schools. This is his, his uh, function, functionality test. This is when he was in middle school, in eighth grade. He was really really bad in eighth grade. So this is his ESE teacher saying that he drew questionable pictures on vocabulary worksheets. You think any of this information was shared with the psychiatrist? Lots of gaps, lots of silos of information here. Nobody had a full picture of what was happening. September, 3rd, September 11th, eighth grade, uh, 2013, 
He returned from being out of internal suspension. After discussing and lecturing about the Civil War in America, he became fixated on death and assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Some questions he asked were, what did it sound like when Lincoln was shot? Did it go pop, pop, pop really fast? Was there blood everywhere? After the war, what did they do with all the bodies? Did they eat them? Here's another report from his ESE teacher. What would you rather be doing? He said, I'd rather be on the street killing animals and setting fires. Everybody knew. This was no surprise. When this happened, when we interviewed the security monitor, they said, oh yeah, I knew who it was. That was Crazy Boy. That's what they called him, Crazy Boy. I want to talk a little bit about the actual event. Okay? So Marjorie Stoneman Douglas is a very, very large campus. Over 3,000 kids go to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. He attacked one building, the top right building, Building 12. Here's the timeline that the MSD commission developed. 219, he exits an Uber with that rifle bag that he was searching for online. The shooting begins at 221. A code red wasn't called for three minutes. By then, it's almost over. Everybody's almost dead by then. He leaves after six minutes. He flees. The fire alarm went off from the smoke from the AR. And so all the kids are streaming out of the building. He escapes with all the kids. Law enforcement has no idea. They don't enter the building for 11 minutes. 11 minutes. There were massive failures of the communications. The Motorola radios thrail, uh, throttled. SWAT couldn't communicate. They had to use hand signals so they didn't shoot each other. Law enforcement didn't, go, didn't enter for 11 minutes. They didn't know where he was. They thought he was still in the building. The nine Broward Sheriff's Office deputies that responded, they all waited outside. The SRO that was on campus, the only guy with a gun, upon going to the front of the building, in, under, in a minute and 44 seconds, he heard the gunshots reverberating in his chest. He went and hid behind a concrete pillar for 48 minutes. 251, after he leaves the building, he enters Subway and orders an icy. Law enforcement doesn't go to the third floor for 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Five kids and one teacher died on the third floor. It's a massive campus. My daughter was at the middle school at the time. My older son was at the high school. Thank God he wasn't in that building. He enters the, gets out of an Uber, enters the building through an unlocked, unstaffed gate. We don't do that anymore. Walks into the stairwell, takes his AR out of his rifle bag, and then proceeds to go in the hallway, shooting kids in the hallway that he saw, and then shooting into the classrooms. This is from the fire alarm. The kids on the third floor don't know there's a shooting going on. He's on, the, he's on the second floor coming up the stairwell. They're streaming out of the building. They just think it's a fire alarm. They didn't have positive alarm sequence. They didn't hold the kids in the classroom. Let's make sure it's a fire. You got 13 buildings on campus. Maybe it does, maybe makes sense. They're all masonry buildings. Maybe it makes sense. Let's, let's, let's wait. Let's see what's going on. No. Everybody starts streaming out of the building. As he's coming up the stairwell, they're going down. Thank God most of them got out alive. This is everybody streaming out of the building. And then he blends in with the crowd, unbeknownst to law enforcement. Then he goes to the third floor teacher's lounge, sets up his bipod, tries to do a Las Vegas to all those kids that are streaming out of all the other 12 buildings. Thank God he was unsuccessful. We had hurricane glass in, in, uh, in South Florida. Bullets shattered as they and fragmented as they went out. And so he dropped his weapon along with hundreds of rounds of ammunition. So 
As I said, he did not enter any of the classrooms. Like in Uvalde, he shot through Alex's classroom door window, and that gave him clear line of sight to, to shoot the kids. He murdered Alex and two other children, injuring five others in just Alex's classroom door. Kids tried to get into the safer corner, the area outside of the shooting fan, but they weren't, a lot of them weren't successful. Two kids died because they couldn't get in the safer corner because what was there? The teacher's desk and other immovable objects. Some kids tried to hide behind TV sets because there wasn't enough room in the safer corner. Again, it's behind the line. Both of them died. This is him after he, after he killed 17 people. He escapes with the, with the other kids, goes to Subway, and orders an icy. There was a little girl named, a girl that was shot, her name was um, Maddie Wolford. Her brother was also in the school, escapes the school. And then uh, Nick Cruz came and sat down right after me. Did you know who he was? No. Ever meet him before? Never. Just sat down? Just sat down next to me. I didn't think much of it because I was panicked. So I was just trying to get back home. So. Alex was friends with him. He had no idea who. who, who who he was, he just sat down next to him. Unbeknownst to him, he didn't know his sister was just shot by this, by this murderer. He says, hey, can you give me a ride? He thought, he thought he was off a little bit, and so thank God he did give him a ride. Even in prison for the last four and a half years, he is still obsessed with murder. He's drawing pictures in prison. During the trial, he's drawing pictures. He wrote asking, this is just recently, asking for my brothers and sisters of blood and death to kill your children. I ask for mass murderers and terrorists to destroy this effing country and spread evil and destruction. So Florida has come up with a lot of best practices. We've changed everything uh, about school safety in Florida. These are just some of our best practices that we developed. Law enforcement did not have access to the cameras. They do now. There's been a lot of accountability. The Broward Sheriff's Office, uh, the Broward Sheriff, school resource officer, the one that was at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, went and hid behind a building for 48 minutes. He was indicted on 17 counts of child neglect. His trial has not come up yet. Former superintendent, his general counsel, and the chief technology officer were all indicted. And Governor Ron DeSantis just last week removed four school board members after a grand jury found that they committed deceit, malfeasance, misfeasance, neglect of duty, and incompetence. We've instituted a lot of statewide measures. We created an office of school safety. We have school safety specialist positions that are in charge of school safety in every school district. We now have an anonymous threat reporting system. We have threat assessment teams in every school. Every school must have an active assailant response policy. We have ERPO and risk protection orders in Florida, which we've used thousands, over 8,000 times. After the uh, Highland Park shooting, they have, a, they have a red flag law there, but they've only used it 166 times. We've used ours over 8,000. Every school in Florida is required by law to have at least one armed school safety officer. Every school in Florida. And we passed, we have a Alyssa's Alert, which is a panic app law. So I'm gonna skip through a little of this. There's a lot of material here. 
a lot of law enforcement response failures. Every Stillman Douglas family has a story from that day, of course. In too many cases, there are stories of grief, anger, and unending sadness. Max Schachter is one of those parents. His son Alex died on that horrific day. Over the past three years, his family has strived to make sure Alex didn't die in vain. Aaron Guy has a new resource that you can start using now to see just how safe your child's school really is. I, I still can't believe this is my, my reality. Um, you know, every day Alex isn't here at dinner. I, I don't have his smile or his, his beautiful laugh. I can't go upstairs and, and tuck him into bed and give him a kiss and tell him I love him. Um, you know, it's, it's, this is every day for me. Max Schachter wanted to know more about violence in schools. With other children in the district, his questions took him to the state level and a very confusing spreadsheet. I was presented with 1.6 million cells of data and it was just overwhelming and very, very difficult to, uh, to analyze. That's when he knew he needed to make this information easier for parents to access. So he created safeschoolsforalex.org, a dashboard that organizes incidents that happen in schools all across the state. Prior to this dashboard being available, there was no way for parents to get information about what was happening in their school. From fighting to bullying, sexual harassment to weapons, this dashboard shares data from all over the state, including Palm Beach, Martin, St. Lucie, Indian River, and Okeechobee counties. The goal of this site is to reduce violence, reduce suspensions, and create a positive culture and climate in schools. A resource for parents, teachers, and school board members alike. It gives them the ability to, uh, to target and to uh, focus resources and help children um, at a level they've never been able to do before. So Safe Schools for Alex, a charity that my wife and I started after the shooting, um, during one of our MSD commission meetings, I found out that every school in Florida is required to report incidents of violence to the state DOE. And I have three other children. I wanted to see what was happening in their school. Because I never got a call from the principal saying, hey, great news, parents. It's Monday morning. I want to let you know our bullying numbers dropped by 20% this, this month. I never got that call. No parents ever gotten that call. That call doesn't exist. But when I went to go look at this data, they said, oh yeah, Max, it's just, it's right there. It's on the website. I went to go look at it. I found a massive Excel spreadsheet, 11 million cells of data. And I'm like, what am I gonna do with this? How am I going to look up my kid's school? How am I gonna understand it? How am I gonna, how do I know if these numbers are good or bad or high or low? So I created this dashboard and it's on our site, safeschoolsforalex.org. All the data is from the state DOE website. It's all public information. We've done five dashboards in five states currently, and the mission is to reduce violence, not only school shootings, but just violence in general. Reduce suspensions create, and create a positive culture and climate by educating law enforcement, teachers, administrators, school board members, legislators, and of course, parents. So, and, and Virginia. <clears throat> so here's Here's the DOE website that I went to. It's right there. All you do is got to go down there and click on the, the Excel spreadsheet. And this is what I saw, OK? Impossible, really useless to understand, especially for a parent. But Florida's not alone. This is, this is Pennsylvania's data, OK? Again, buried in, on their website. And if you want to see their school safety data, you got to find it first, and then you go on the left-hand side, and you got to click on uh, school safety historic. Got to open that folder. Okay, wait, you're not, you're not there yet. Then it opens another folder to all the years. You click on the years, okay? Then you hit open that folder. Then you got to sort by the school district. Open that folder. Oh, I forgot to hit button. Okay, folder after folder after folder. It's like DOS 2.0. This website was built like 17 years ago. This is Pennsylvania's data. Folder upon folder upon folder. And then finally, you get to a PDF of one school. One school. How do you know if those numbers are good or bad or high or low? Very, very difficult if you're looking at one PDF at a, at a time amongst thousands of schools. So in Florida, all the data we collect is 
everything that's happening in the school, battery, sexual battery, physical attack, drug use, drug sales, weapon possession, uh, fighting, sex offenses, alcohol, bullying, vaping, all that information, okay? So this is the dashboard, and I wanna just go over this with you. I'm, I'm sorry if it's a little small, but basically what you can do is any, any parent, school board member, most school districts don't even have dashboards like this, but you can, you can type in any school in the entire state, any public school, and see exactly what's happening inside your school. So this shows that Marjorie Stoneman Douglas reported 1.3 incidents per 100 students. And when compared to all high schools statewide, it falls into a very low category. You can hover over violent incidents on the right side in the green. It'll show you that they reported six violent incidents, fighting and threat being up at the top. Uh, you can hover over property incidents, and, and it shows that they reported one property incident being vandalism. Uh, you can hover over drug and public order, and this uh, it shows that they reported 35 drug and public order incidents. And you can look at discipline data. So on the bottom left there is the suspension information. It shows in-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions. And then for the first time, you, uh, any parent or school board member, in you know, school boards, they have their information. The principal might have their specific school information, but they've never seen any other school. They don't have the ability to compare it against different schools. They don't have to compare it against any other district. Now in Broward County, the school board member could get this information. She just sends an email to IT and then two weeks later she gets a report. So here in, on the compare page, you can sort by fighting. And this shows you every school district where the levels are, okay? So this shows that Broward reported the highest numbers of fighting incidents in the state. We can, so we can factor in enrollment, okay? And, but if you factor in enrollment, then actually numbers change. And it's not Broward, but it's actually Gadsden. You can look at bullying information. Obviously, bullying a precursor to a lot of violence going on and very pervasive. This shows you, uh, you know, what's happening on the bullying numbers. Okay, we've got, uh, let's see here physical attack numbers. A lot of great information here. I did not create this to penalize schools, to, uh, to you know, say that a school is unsafe or is bad. You could actually have a school that reports high numbers be the safest school around. You could just have a really great principal that is not messing around and take safety and security seriously. And what we hope, and, and then you can actually sort by school. You can sort by every school in the state um, every school in your county, you can sort by zip code to look at the schools that are geographically in your same area. And the, the, my wife always says, okay, Max, you built a dashboard, now what? How does that make schools safe? And my answer to her is that, you know, we built this so that hopefully school districts and parents can have this type of information to really help them. Because parents are, you drop your kid off at school, you have no idea what's happening inside the classroom. So this gives them a lot of information to have those conversations with school districts that need to take place. You know, Marjorie Soma Douglas used to tell us there wasn't a drug problem. Oh, there's, no, there's no drug problem, there's no drugs here. Well then why did you lock the bathrooms on the first floor because of a vaping issue? And kids on the third floor went to try to go in the bathroom but they couldn't because they were locked. The murderer shot them down the hallway and then went over, as they were on the ground, and executed them, put the AR-15 to their head, and executed them at point-blank range. But there's no drug problem at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. So this gives information parents the information they need to have intelligent conversations, and school districts need to have this information. We hope this can be used to surge resources into schools and help the children that need it most. How are you going to be able to do that if you're not looking at the data? Here, the, you can sort by zip code. So my daughter went to Westglades Middle, and I don't know if you can see it, but 
underneath fighting. It shows that Westglades reported 13 fighting incidents, while Coral Springs Middle reported 34 fighting incidents. And we hope that this will encourage collaboration, cooperation amongst the schools to say, hey, maybe you have a program that we don't. You can look at suspension data. And I'm just a dad, you know, before this happened. I'm not an educator, haven't been for, for decades. When I looked at this stuff, my jaw dropped. It shows that, you know, the numbers of out of school suspensions, Ridge Community High School reported 619 out of school suspensions in one year. I guarantee you, they didn't realize that Polk County occupies seven of the 10, top 10 spots for out of school suspensions in the entire state, because you're not looking at a dashboard. You just look at an Excel spreadsheet. So a lot of great information here. Um, we just got a, a grant. Uh, thank you to BJA uh, and Christian Mahoney. Uh, we got a grant, a Stop School Violence grant to work with the Florida Department of Education and uh, with the University of Florida. We're gonna create a proof of concept. So I built this just based on you know, what I wanted to see as a parent, but now University of Florida is conducting stakeholder interviews, focus groups, to really, uh, we're working with, with uh, all the stakeholders in Florida, superintendents, principals, to see how they, what they would like to see in a dashboard, and then, and then that's gonna give us a lot of great information. And in Florida, what Florida's doing is, this data I'm showing you is like yearly. We just implemented a new rule in, uh, in Florida where they're increasing the frequency to monthly. Because this, this stuff we were looking at, by the time you're looking at it, it's old, stale, the kids have moved on. Now we're looking at monthly data and we're gonna, the, the new, the new uh, website will look at trends on monthly information so that it's live, actionable, schools can really maneuver and change things to make schools safer and a better learning environment for all children. Here's some of the benefits of this, our school safety dashboard. It's free, user-friendly, containing critical data on violence, drugs, and discipline. We're in five states. Our goal is to do it in every state, but we're a small nonprofit. That's why I'm here. I hope you guys can help me. Uh, it's credible, objective, and external documentation for grant funding applications as well as bond referendum. If you have a school district that, that's trying to apply for all of the amazing funding that, that BJA offers and OJP, all the evidence is right there in the dashboard. You don't have to crunch the numbers. Um, you know, all the evidence on, on school safety is right there. If your numbers are high, all you have to do is just hit print and it, it prints it up right there. Data for districts seeking legislative support, identifies patterns and trends of drugs, violence, and discipline in your district. It assists school boards to target resources effectively. It has the ability to compare all school districts and all schools across all incident and data and discipline data and easily view metrics to identify schools that are over-reporting by mistake and also under-reporting. Questions? You can ask me anything, I'm here. I know it's a lot. Well, Max, first of all, I am so sorry for your loss. Thank you. Number one. Thank you. Uh, incredible presentation. Um, as a father who has kids the same age as Alex, hits home for me, really does. And super impressed on how you were able to hold it together and, and move forward with your life. So that's just my statement, but my question is, more on uh, profiling that perpetrator a little bit. And w was that perpetrator a self-identified incel? That has not, none of the evidence so far has, has uh, come out about that. Because right, no. I noticed he was Googling how to kill girls, which is a red yeah. flag for incel. I mean, he had a girlfriend. He did? Yeah. All right, that's it, thank you. Yeah, no, good question. Any other questions? And I'm going to be uh, in, on a panel later with Donna and, and Kurt Lavarello, and we're going to talk. We're going to talk 
Um, I have a little, a short presentation then. I'll talk about threat assessments and talk about what some of the problems are in the state of Florida um, to get your input as well. So there's a lot of problems with this data. Um, the school safety incident reporting, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I'm gonna talk about some of the, the data that we just looked at in the last MSD commission meeting. And we have threat assessment teams in every school but we're just looking at the data and that's all messed up as well. So you've got some school districts that are doing a, a massive amount of threat assessments and then some are doing hardly any. And I'll, I'll show you that data as well. Uh, hi, um, thank you for sharing. Uh, that was very powerful. Uh, I, well, following up on that question, I wanted to ask if there was any connection to video games. I noticed that one of uh, his email addresses that you showed had Makarov in it. And that just kind of stuck out to me because I remember a Call of Duty game where one of the characters named Makarov commits a mass murder. So I was just wondering if there was a connection. There. You're probably right. That's probably the connection. I'm sure he played video games as does every kid. Um, but that's, that has not come out as being, you know, anything out of the ordinary. Thank you. That's okay. Uh, so I'm kind of stunned that there aren't more states that have adopted this dashboard model. And I know you mentioned you're a small nonprofit, so it might just be hard to get out to the masses, but I'm just thinking states should be falling over themselves to get access to this kind of dashboard. And so as a resident of the state of Maryland, I'm just curious what would be your recommendation for how to navigate getting something like this done and also some of the pushback that you hear about uh, from states when they maybe don't want to do it. So we don't work with any states. We, all this data is public on all these DOE websites. We go and grab the data and, and put it in the dashboard. So I have made dozens of presentations to states. I can't get anybody to, 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 want, to want to work with us. It's, it's upsetting, it's, it's shocking, um, but I think that you know, they don't want this information out. You know? Um, they don't want the parents to have this kind of information. And I, I've had even conversations with, uh, with, with Utah that said, they don't make this information public. I said, oh, well, if we make it public, then, then the schools are gonna underreport. I'm like, hello, they're already underreporting. You know, sunlight is the best disinfectant. That's what we've learned in Florida. So. I would love to work with more states. Uh, you know, it's, it's free, I'll do all the work. You know, but it, it helps to, to have conversations with all the DOEs, uh, because everybody does things differently. In Florida, we use 26 different incident categories. Kentucky uses 47, so, um, you know, I have to have conversations with, well, all of them. Um, and and I, I would love your help to, to build it out and any ideas that you have. You know, we're not here to uh, to make to, to uh, make schools feel bad. I I have I would I would even make it you know uh, different. There you know a public facing site and a back end site. I would build it for school districts or for states. Uh, you know we're we're here to give school districts and states information they need to to make schools safer. So we're not here to you know um, call anybody out. So Cassie, your question brings up uh, what would have been a link then to my uh, suggestion. Max, I know you're in the learning curve of what I just can do or who we are and, and we've had many conversations of how uh, we might be able to help you from a data perspective, but from a programmatic perspective, just the education uh, or the availability of this effort and uh, obviously you being the, the face of this effort uh, and potentially IGIS or the IGIS community uh, in different forms and fashion can be the voice for it or can help you promulgate this. Yeah, right? So there, there is definitely ways that uh, with partnerships, uh, with the federal funders seeing value to this, um, a, a, a dashboard concept is one that I think can definitely have legs. Yeah, I'd love the feds to be using stuff like this. I mean, we're giving out, you know, you know hundreds of millions of billions of dollars. Let's use data to make schools safer as opposed to just throwing money uh, at, at, at you know, shiny objects that aren't gonna do anything for safety and security of our kids. You made reference to BJA and Kristen Mahoney. Did, uh, did they see the dashboard? Yes, oh, you know? okay. yes, yes, yes. So, and uh, we happen to know that Kristen likes dashboards. 
so that being said, is um, did you have any next steps with her? Just out of curiosity. I do. I'm saying. Did you have any next steps with her? Um, you know, I, I presented this. I don't know. If, I don't know if Kristen was on the call, um, but um, I work with Kristen with the Mass Violence Advisory Initiative. She's been wonderful. Um, I did present this to some people, but you know, uh, my experiences with the feds, they're, they're like, you know, oh, that's a local issue. You know, I, I haven't um, been able to get buy-in at the federal level. There's no federal, you know, standards. There's no federal requirements on a lot of this stuff. I wish there was, and any any guidance. You guys are the experts, so um, that's why I'm here, and uh, appreciate all the input and suggestions you have.